dear friends in the JLI world. My name is Rabbi Abba Perlmutter, and I am, I am here in Long Beach, California, uh, quarantined in my house for the past number of weeks. I've gone out a little bit, but I hope that this video finds you and your family well. Today we are going to talk a little bit about laughter. Why? For two reasons. Number one is because at this time, or what we're experiencing, everybody needs a little bit of laughter. And the fact that you are tuning into this tells me two things. Number one, you have nothing else to do today on a Sunday afternoon. You've already finished with all of your Netflix and Disney Plus and everything else. You've gone to your general WhatsApp groups, and I have nothing to do, so you figure you'll tune into Rabbi Perlmutter. Number two, what else it tells me is that you are not looking for a very highbrow lecture right now. What do I mean by highbrow? I mean a lecture given by a rabbi that is very intense, that has a lot of uh, messages, that's very deep with a lot of sources. You've come here to hear something about laughter and about humor. And why at this particular moment in our lives, this is extremely important to have. So, we're going to do something that is not going to be very, very intellectually challenging. So I don't expect many questions at the end of this lecture. But I hope that the little time that we get to spend with each other today will be able to push out all of the negativity that is surrounding us in this challenging times. I hope that I don't have to convince you about the benefits of laughter and what laughter brings to a person's life. Studies have shown in major universities across the world what people who laugh more during the day, what kind of benefits it brings to them. Let me just share a few with you, all right? Number one, laughter boosts immunity. You can't go wrong with that. Everybody today is worried about health, and what laughing does and what humor does is it boosts your immunity. Number two, it lowers stress hormones. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, isn't that a benefit in today's day and age, that it lessens and lowers down our stress hormones? If you're watching any news channel, whether it's cable, local news, picking up a newspaper, everything is negative, it's stressful. Laughter lowers those stress hormones. It relaxes your muscles, makes you feel a little better, prevents heart disease. I mean, it doesn't take away from the fact that you should have a healthy diet. You should have a healthy diet, but laughter relaxes and prevents heart disease. That's all the physical benefits mental health benefits that we need today number one it adds joy and zest to your life <laughs> laughter just helps you it relieves stress oh ladies and gentlemen relieving stress is number one critically today i mean you know my middle name is anxious i'm a holocaust survivor's kid i was born with anxiety so i need to laugh i need to have humor because it lessens that anxiety and stress it improves my mood. You know, I hear about things, but I'm laughing and uh, I'm not, I feel a little better. Strengthens resilience. Then the social benefits. But ladies and gentlemen, let me be crystal clear about this. We need to have social distancing. So laughter in the social benefits is, of course, it strengthens relationships. When we're going to be able to get back with each other, it's going to help us. Help us. It attracts others to us. You'll have more friends. And if you have more friends, you'll be happier. And if you're happier, you'll be healthier. And if you're healthier, you're going to live longer. And if you live longer, you're going to thank me, Rabbi Abba Perlmutter, here at JLI today for your long life. Well, these are the benefits of laughter, and I hope that I didn't have to convince you of that. 
In Judaism, we see that the first Jew, the very first Jew in the world, Abraham, named his son what? Laughter. Yitzchak. God made me laugh. Sarah laughed. Abraham laughed. We're a people who like to laugh. We've gone through a lot in our history, but we've also laughed a lot in our history. We've created some of the funniest people in the history of the world are Jewish. Because the first Jew was a Jew of laughter. He laughed. Isaac, not so much, but Abraham liked to laugh. Now, also, why do we like to laugh? One of the most crucial things of a Jew and of a person is to try to imitate God. We try to imitate him. God is kind, we're kind. God is beneficent, we try to be beneficent. God is caring, God is forgiving. All of those attributes we try to emulate. What about humor? Where do we find that God laughs? Where do we find that he, he has any type of humor? Because if you look out in the world, sometimes it seems very, very dark. You know, right now we're dealing with this virus and it, it created a mess globally, something we've never seen in our lifetimes. So where do we have the fact that God likes to laugh? So I'm going to prove it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that God has a sense of humor. If you look in the first chapters of Genesis, when God creates man and woman, what does he tell man? God says to man, now it's going to be your responsibility to leave your wife and to clean. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's your responsibility to leave your father and your mother and cling onto your wife and you shall become one. What did God create with that verse? What institution did God create with that verse? If you said laughter, give yourself a pat on the back. Why laughter? Because he created marriage. Marriage, ladies and gentlemen. Marriage is the type of institution that has given God countless hours of enjoyment. He looks down at the world and he sees two people trying to make it together under one roof. And what he did was he created two separate genders. Now, I have to say this as a point. I am going to use generalizations when it comes to male and females. And I understand that gender is very nuanced. But for two reasons, I'm going to be generalizing today. Number one, because this is not a gender studies course. We're not studying gender relationships. Number two is, it's my lecture. And I want to generalize. So I'm going to generalize. God created two genders. He created male and he created female. Male, he made into the hunter, the tough guy, the going guy, the outgoing guy. And the woman, he made childbearing, the one that was supposed to stay home, raise the children, the softer gender, the motherly gender, the one that gives life. And the father is the more outgoing, the more aggressive one. And you have these two genders, and God expects the man and the woman to come together and to build this harmonious relationship that we call a good marriage. Imagine, here's a guy who grows up, and even when we're in elementary school, when you see a girl, what is your reaction? I don't go near them, don't go near them, don't go near any of the girls. The girls, don't go near the guys. The guys, they're rough, they play cowboys and guns and all of these things. The girls are nice. They're made of sugar and spice and everything nice. The boys are dirty. Eh. So these two genders, forget it. Right now in elementary school, they're separate. They don't want to have to do with each other. But as they grow up, all of a sudden, they start looking at each other differently. Now, they haven't changed, but they look at each other differently right now. When you get into high school, you start having relationships. You have a girlfriend, your first girlfriend. You're proud of her. She's proud of you. Look at you. She got the superstar, the best guy in school. You got the prom queen. Everything is going well. And you realize that you begin to see women and this other gender in a different light. But you have not really changed. You're still that old hunter that God made. So, for example, when she says to you, honey, I would like to go see a movie. You think, great. I love movies. It's wonderful. I love going out there. So you're expecting her to go to a movie that guys like. 
What do guys like in a movie? They love fast cars. They love bombs. They love beer. They love things being blown up. They love it. They love it. What does she like? She likes a movie that no guy likes. Talking. She likes to go to a movie where people talk, where people express their emotions. So what do you do in the name of lo love? What do you do in the name of love? You go to that movie and you're sitting there in that movie and you're thinking to yourself, why didn't I bring a razor blade? I have to listen to all of these talking. And God realizes this and he sees that the two genders try to get along with each other, but they're different. And he has this great time up there laughing, seeing all the foibles that go on. I'll give you an example. Me and my wife. I am a Holocaust survivor's kid. Both of my parents survived the Holocaust, and I grew up in Montreal. I grew up in a family that was very, very quiet. There was four of us. I have a sister, my two parents, and myself. If the phone rang once or twice a week, it was a very busy week. The phone is ringing, let's go. Let's go answer the phone. Shh. Everybody, the phone is ringing. My father, Sam, was a very quiet man. My mother, when he went to a party and my mother said, sit down here, that's where she found him four hours later. You hardly said anything. My mother was a little bit more talkative, had better sense of humor. But our house was an extremely quiet house. Very cautious, very orderly. Very, 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 very quiet. My father, when he went to the bank, put on a tie, took me by the hand, and when he went into the bank, he said to me, don't talk. There's no talking in the bank. I said, Dad, what do you mean there's no talking in the bank? And it's, it's a bank. We're here to do business. We're here to do business. Not to talk, no frivolity. This was my father, a man that was extremely faithful, prayed three times a day, learned very much, you know, did everything according to the book, but was very quiet. And that was our house. Our dinners lasted maybe 20 to 30 minutes. Then we separated, everyone went to their rooms and did their own, their own thing. I thought this was a normal household. That's how people are. They're quiet, they talk softly, they appreciate each other, and they're respectful to each other. Then I have a friend. And my friend suggested, why don't you go out with this girl, Khan? Stop. Okay. She had a wonderful reputation, and I said, sure, I would like to. So we dated. The first date, I was very quiet, because naturally, I'm a very quiet guy. I'm not an outgoing guy. I'm very hot, very shy, and very sweet, very quiet. But my wife, she's not quiet. God bless her. So the first date, I said six words, and she said 6,000 words. That was about the proportion. Second date, a little better. And then she asked me if I would like to meet her parents and then her parents. They were very, very nice the first time I met them. Her father was quiet, her mother was quiet, and her brother was quiet, and her little sister was quiet. And then they invited me for dinner before I got engaged. Okay, I come for dinner. There's five of them. We're four, they're five. They're sitting around the table, and I did not know if I'm sitting at the stock dinner table or in the middle of Times Square. My father-in-law, who, God bless his memory, was a salesman, had two phones. On one phone, he was trying to sell plastic to some businessman in Ohio. He also had a side gig that he was a matchmaker. So he's trying to convince a guy to go out with this particular girl. And he's screaming in both phones. And I'm thinking to myself, holy mackerel, what happens if he crosses the lines? And he sells the guy in Ohio, the blonde girl, and this guy who's looking for a girl, he sells him the plastics. But this family was out of bounds, out of bounds. They were loud, they were boisterous, their front door never closed. People kept coming and going and coming and going. It was unbelievable. I'd never seen a family like this. And I'm thinking to myself, wow. My parents are going to come here and meet these people. It's going to be something special. The Pearl Mothers, quiet. The Stocks, boisterous. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen? I married that woman. I married her. Why? Because, first of all, I love her. I love her. 
We're going on 41 years of marriage and we're going strong. Oh, this, these six weeks have been a test. Believe me, these six weeks that I were together in the house, you know, 24 seven has been, well, oh, it's great, but it just shows how much I really love her and how much I care for her. And I found out so much about her these past six weeks. Like I didn't even know she had a brother. Now I know that she has a brother, you know, so laugh. So these two families, the promoters and the stocks come together. I know for a fact that God is laugh, upstairs laughing. He's saying, how is Abba Perlmutter and Chani Stark going to make this family together? And we do it. We struggle, we trip, we laugh, we have fun, we do all of, all of these things. And that's why if God laughs, and I know that he's laughing, we need to laugh. We need to laugh as well. Because what happens afterwards is something incredible. What is incredible? Now, this guy and this girl meet. They meet. And they say to themselves, you know what? Let us start a family. And I want to talk for a minute about family. But before I do that, I want to tell you something. I know you probably can tell because the camera adds between 10 and 15 pounds. But a number of years ago, I went on a very, very strict diet. Very strict diet. And I lost 50 pounds. 50. Five, zero. 50 pounds. Now, why? Why would I do that? I am a confirmed foodie. I love food. Food is comfort to me. I have a secret to share that I, from time to time at night, I watch the food channel just to look at food. I love it. Why? My mother was a Holocaust survivor and kept pushing and pushing and pushing food on me. As a matter of fact, I remember the time when I was playing baseball and I thought of myself as the great Willie Mays. He was my hero as a kid. And I was in center field. It was a beautiful summer's day in Montreal. And I'm standing there. It's 5 o'clock. We're playing baseball. And I see a lady running into the outfield. This crazy lady is running towards me. Who is this crazy lady? It's my mother. And she's bringing me dinner. She brought me dinner in the outfield. So I am a confirmed foodie. I love food. I love food so much that after I finish breakfast in the morning, my first thought is what's for lunch i once had an associate that was thin he was a normal looking guy and i used to say to him hey what did you have for lunch and he said uh, lunch 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 but i didn't have lunch today i never missed lunch never missed lunch so i'm a confirmed i love food i'm confirmed foodie why would i go on a crazy diet and lose 50 pounds because I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I did it because I, in life now, at my stage, I have only one goal in life. That's it. One goal. What is that goal? It's not to build big palaces. It's not to take over the world. It's not to be a revolutionary. I want to live long enough to take revenge on my children. I have six children. Six Two boys, four girls. Two girls, four boys. I don't know why I said that. Two girls, four boys. They're all married, except for my baby, the youngest one. They all have children. Why do I want to take revenge on them? Because what they did to me. No, what I do now is when I go to my daughter's house, I bring them, I bring these cookies that I crumble all around. I give my grandchildren these candies these licking candies that are sweet and sticky so they can put it all around their house i go to my daughter's bed i lay down i take off my socks i drop in the middle of the room i do to them exactly what they did to me and my wife why because only children only children can do to you what nobody else can do to you nobody can do to you and you know what you're going to do you're going to forgive them you are going to forgive them so let me tell you a little story what I mean when I talk about the forgiveness part, why only children will get that from you and nobody else. One of my sons, he won't be mentioned, I'm not going to mention his name because he may put a restraining order against me, he was a little guy, he was maybe about five years old, and he was running a little fever, so he was hot, and we took him and we said to ourselves, you know what, let's take him and put him in bed 
My wife gave him Tylenol. And he put up this onesies, you know, those onesies little pajamas that these kids wear. And I took him into my bed. Okay? We both fall asleep. Me and my five-year-old son. That night, ladies and gentlemen, I had the dream of dreams. The dream of dreams. What happened? I was walking in a meadow. The sun was shining. It was a beautiful day, just like here in California. We have those beautiful California days. Not warm, not too cold. A little breeze from the background is coming. The trees are shaking a little bit, whistling. It's a beautiful day in this meadow. I'm walking and walking, and from a distance, I see there's a stream that runs through the meadow. Now, I'm a little tired because I've been walking for a while. So I think to myself, hey, you know what? What I'm going to do, I'm going to take a little dip in that stream. I figured, why not? I get ready. I go to the edge of the stream, and I jump into the stream. Ladies and gentlemen, I can begin to tell you and to explain how luxurious that stream felt. It was warm. It was inviting. It was pure rapture. Pure rapture. Warm. Warm. And warmer. And I was feeling like a million dollars in there, swimming along, not a care in the world in this dream. Until... I found out by reaching my hand down and feeling my leg that I am in the stream. I was in Flushing Meadows, New York, that my son, my beautiful five-year-old son, had created the dream in my bed. And I was actually in a stream. So what did I do? What did I do? Five-year-old kid running a fever creates a stream in your bed. What do I do? I do everything that every father in the history of mankind has done. I woke up my wife and told her to change her. That's it. After that, we were changed, we went back to sleep. Only he can get away with this. I have many friends and many acquaintances, but nobody can do that except children. And that's why I find that living as long as I can to take revenge on my children is going to be the perfect perfect sequel to, you know, to this story. And I find that with my kids, we're able to laugh, we're able to enjoy, we have a wonderful time, because I understand that the few years that I have on this earth, no matter what, whether it's uh, another 10, 20 years, I hope to live a long time, see my grandchildren grow up, great, great grandchildren grow up, but I want to live it to the fullest with meaning. And part of living life to to the fullest and have meaning within Judaism is humor, is simcha, is joy. The great Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, told us that joy is not a mitzvah. There's no mitzvah of joy. But where joy can lead you, where joy takes you to heights, no mitzvah, no commandment, no action could lead you there. And on the contrary, where melancholy and depression pull you down, Nothing else can pull you down there. So joy became an integral part of our fabric and our family. And I encourage you to please to go out there and whenever you are and to find things to be able to laugh about and have some humor in your life, even if you're not a humorous person, even if you're not someone that had to develop a sense of humor because we lived in this Holocaust environment and it was very thick, the Holocaust. If you came into my house in Montreal, the Holocaust hung like a, like a curtain in our house. So we, me and my sister had to develop a sense of humor. But even if you didn't, there are many places where you can go to to have a good laugh or two. You have the internet. Go online. There's joke books. There's other places to go. I myself love, love, whenever I'm a little down, to read Jewish humor. I love Jewish stories. I love stories, especially from the shtetl, places that took place in Eastern Europe. It's because I'm from, my parents are from Eastern Europe. I feel like I'm from Eastern Europe. And my mother read to us stories about Eastern Europe in Yiddish when me and my sister were young. So I, I, 
I went, I, 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 I had this affinity towards that kind of literature. So I love to read stories, and many of these stories are funny. The writers are funny. They created a, a, a fanciful place called the Shtetl. And I'd like to share one story with you just to give you an example of what I mean about Jewish humor found even, even in stories about our history. A shtetl, ladies and gentlemen, by the way, was not something every city could call itself. No, 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 no. A shtetl had to have certain criteria. Number one, a shtetl had to have what they called a gvir. What's a gvir? A gvir is a very wealthy man. He owned the tavern, the forest, the inn. Many of the people in town worked for him. He was the gvir. He was the rich, rich man in town. And he had respect. Everybody gave this man respect. On the other side, you had the Thompson. You had the poor guy. Couldn't make a living. No matter what he tried, every day was a struggle. No matter what, what they used to say about these poor people that if they went into the business of uh, shrouds, people would stop dying. People would stop dying. That was at least two criteria every step will have to have. And of course, a rabbi. So we get all we went to this if we go to this particular town and we take a look. We find the Gvir, we find the rich guy in town. Now you would think, you would think that the rich guy in town would be the happiest guy. Look at him. He has all the money, he lives in a beautiful home. He's like, what's happening? And the fiddler on the roof says, everybody comes, asks advice, he eats well, everything. So you would think that this guy in this particular town would be the happiest guy. Sorry, not, not in this story. In this story, the rich man who we are going to call Shmerel is not happy. Why is he not happy? Because Shmerel is extremely stingy. He is so, so stingy. He can't spend a penny. Oh, to spend a penny, to get a penny out of Shmerel is like pulling teeth, getting water out of a stone. Impossible. And what happens when you're so stingy? You also create not, not good feelings in your family because he doesn't spend money not on his wife, not on his children. His house is threadbare. He doesn't like to buy new furniture. doesn't buy his wife new clothing. So it causes friction in the house. His wife knows that he has all this money, Shmero, but he doesn't want to spend it. He doesn't want to share it. So things between him and his wife were very, very bad. Very bad. They were at each other's throats day after day. And Shmero couldn't take it anymore. So when you have a problem, when you have a problem, who do you go to? You go to the smartest man in town. Who is the smartest man in town? Who? Now, if you said the rabbi, give yourself a pat on the back. Of course, the rabbi was the smartest man in town. So Shmero made an appointment and came to see the rabbi. He came to see the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, I got this terrible problem. What's the problem, Shmero? Because me and my wife are not getting along very well. I need I need something for you to do. Please help me because I can't go on like this anymore. You can't. So the rabbi says to Shmero, Shmero, listen. In Judaism, there's a way out. You look at the good books. The books tell us that if a husband and a wife are not getting along, you could divorce her. Look, Shmero says, great. I'm willing to, let's go, I'm divorcing. The rabbi says, not so fast, Shmero, not so fast. Why? Because if you divorce her, what's going to happen is you're going to have to pay a lot of money. First for the divorce, then you have to pay for her upkeep, you have to give her other good benefits, clothes, food. It's going to cost you. Why, oh, rabbi, 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 I can't. Shmero says, rabbi, I can't, I can't. You know how tough it is for me to spend a penny Please, I'm asking you, find another solution for me. Please, do me a favor. The rabbi, what do you do besides divorce? I mean, marriage counseling, they're not coming to. He doesn't want to divorce her. What, 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 are, what are the other options? So when a rabbi doesn't know what to do, he strokes his beard. No, he strokes his beard. Starts walking and pacing back and forth. Doesn't know he's thinking of a plan. Then he thinks to himself, no, let me look in some of the holy books, like the books behind me, the books in front of me. He starts looking through the books, turning the pages. Maybe something will happen. He's stalling for time, doesn't know. 
What else could he suggest for Shmeru to do? Bingo. Bingo. He found something. He says, Shmeru, I think I have a solution. Very controversial. Very, very controversial. But one that may work, you want to hear it. Shmeru says, Rabbi, anything. We're not getting along and I don't want to divorce her. Whatever you suggest, I'm going to do. So the rabbi leans in to Shmero. To Shmero calls him closer and says, kill her. Shmero is dumbfounded. What? The rabbi says again, kill her. He wants to kill her? Well, what do you mean kill her, rabbi? I mean, it says in the Torah, you can't kill him. In the Bible, it's clear. We read last week in the portion that thou shalt not commit murder. What do you mean, a killer? Uh, how can I kill my wife? This is crazy. The rabbi said, Shmero, Shmero, calm down. Take it easy. Calm down. I don't mean kill her, strangle her or poison her. Well, oh, God forbid to do something like that. But the good book says right here, the good book says right here that if a man makes a pledge to the congregation and he doesn't pay that pledge then god in heaven well, takes it out on his family so i'm suggestion to you is that come to to show on saturday morning get called up to the torah when the man asks you how much you're going to pledge make a pledge with no intention of paying and that way whatever will happen to your wife and that's it. Shmero says, Rabbi, you are brilliant. You are brilliant. I love you so. Oh, you're great. I'm doing this. So Saturday, Shmero comes to the synagogue. He tells the person in charge, called the Gabbai, I need to be called up to the Torah today, please. I'd like an Aliyah. He calls him up and he says, okay, after they finish reading, they make give a blessing to Shmero and they ask Shmero, how much are you going to donate? For this honor to the synagogue, Shmero says, I'm going to give 50,000 rubles. 50,000 rubles. The whole synagogue rises up in appreciation. Finally, finally, Shmero has come to see the light. He's going to share some of his millions with the congregation. 50,000. They begin to think of all the things they can do in the synagogue. Repair the roof. They can buy new books. That, uh, it's going to be great. Thank God, 50,000 rubles. That night, the, the people in charge wrote down everyone's name who got an aliyah. This guy, that guy, three rubles, five rubles, eight rubles. And then they wrote Shmero, 50,000 rubles. 50,000. And that night, they went to collect it. They went from house to house, and then they came to Shmero's house. They knocked on his door. Shmero opens up the door. Come in, gentlemen. How can I help you? Shmero, today in show, you said in front of the whole congregation that you're giving 50,000. We're here to collect it. Shmero says, get out of my house. Get out. Get out. Uh, never paying that pledge. Don't come back and ask me anymore for it. Shmero did what the rabbi wanted. He goes to sleep that night with one eye open. His wife, no, nothing's going on. She sleeps very well. She wakes up Sunday morning, takes a walk into town, eats a hearty breakfast, feels great. Monday, same thing. Tuesday, same thing. Nothing, not a sneeze, not a sniffle, not a cough, nothing. Okay. All right, what could you do? Okay. Smero goes back to the rabbi after a week or two and says, Rabbi, tell me it's not working. So the rabbi says, of course it's not working, Shmero. What do you think? You don't love her. God is not going to punish her if you don't love her. It's, it's, you're going to are the one that's supposed to suffer. The only reason why we know this is because our father, our, Jacob, when he made a pledge to God, delayed paying his pledge. And because he delayed, his beloved Rachel passed away prematurely. That's how we know this. If you don't love her, nothing is going to help. But so... Shmerel says, ah, oh, now I get it. Now I understand. That's the lover. Okay. So that day, Shmerel goes out and buys her some flowers. 
She unexpected likes the flowers and takes the flowers and puts it away. She's happy, but she's a bit surprised. Schmerl had never bought any flowers, but she thought maybe he's changing his ways. That night, sneeze. She had a sneeze. And Schmerl says, I don't know. Next day, he buys her some other gifts and another gift. And slowly but surely, he's falling in. Their relationship is getting better. And He's getting sicker, and his relationship is getting better, and she's getting sicker, you know. And then one night, Shmeril is running through town. He's running to the rabbi's house, and he knocks on the rabbi's door at 3 o'clock in the morning. And he opens up the door, and he says, Shmeril, what is it? What is it? What is it, Shmeril? And Shmeril says, Rabbi, you have to help me. My wife's not feeling well. She's dying. I mean, you have to do something, please. The rabbi says, but this is... He says, no, no, I don't want it anymore. I don't want it. I love her so much. I need her to live. What do I have to do to make her live? And the rabbi says, there's only one way out, Shmero. Pay the pledge. Pay the pledge. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this story is a story from a little shtetl that illustrates that Shmero, Shmero, no, didn't realize what he had under his roof. He needed to love his wife. It would have saved him anguish and it would have saved him $50,000. If, if Shmerel could have realized that right under his very nose, he had all of the answers to make him happy. All of the answers. And what do we do? We walk around, we look for, we look, we look for other places, we look for love in all the wrong places. But right there and there, Shmerel had it. And what did it cost him? 50,000 rubles. Pay, pay your pledge. The story, of course, is a fanciful story. But what it does, even in a bleak time like now, where people are isolated from each other. They're worried. A story that is fanciful, that's ridiculous, that's outlandish, lifts up the spirit. Ah, Shmero, no one, you know, the wife survived. Shmero survived. The rabbi survived. Everybody at the end, it was a happy, great ending. And we hope for a great ending to this calamity. We hope for a great ending to this story that we're, that, you know, that we're dealing with. And there's a lot of pressure on us right now. We're home. Maybe some of us are not seeing our children or our grandchildren. Maybe some of us are, are lonely. We're alone. This is why this is so crucially important. Humor and laughter precisely right now. In this dark hour is when we need. Jews have always laughed. Have always laughed. Have always been able to. Because they understand that laughter has all of the aforementioned benefits that i read to you from all of these universities you know around the world are telling us that people understand that you know what seriousness has its place yes of course but god made it where we have the antidote we have one little piece that we can add to our lives that will help us so why is it that when we are little children in in preschool we can laugh 400 times a day and yet, when we become adults, we can't. We laugh 40 times a day. And that's in the good times. Can you imagine now how much we're laughing now? Maybe 10 times a day we're laughing. Why is it so? Why do we have to eliminate laughter and humor from our existence in order to feel that we are mature, that we have grown up? No, ladies and gentlemen. You don't grow old by stopping from the end of the and you stop growing old. That's what happens. Right? You grow old when you stop playing games. You got that, right? You grow old when you stop playing games. When you're little, you'll have life. You'll have life. Go to a preschool. Kids are running. They're having the time of their life. I would love, my wife runs a preschool. When this is over, I told her, I'm enrolling. I want to go. I want to do what those kids do. What do they do all day? They nap. They eat. They roll in mud. They have a great time. What do adults do? We become serious. We become serious. We don't talk to each other. We get into fights. There's discord. And think now. Think about the situation now. Ah, so for now, we need to say to ourselves, you know what? Hashem gave us an opportunity. He gave us a tremendous gift. And we need to use that gift. Because if we don't, if we aren't going to be able to live life with joy, if we aren't going to be able to let these endorphins flow through our body, and allow ourselves to be uplifted and allow ourselves to be joyous 
even at a time when it's dark outside. And I understand that many people are going to say, Rabbi, you yes, precisely now, precisely now. And I'm not, and I'm not telling you, don't listen to those, you know, hard thought, you know, philosophical lectures that you will be hearing and the other great lectures on JLI. Beautiful, tremendous. And do that and use your mind. Another great way of pushing out the distractions. But don't forget to include this. Don't forget to include Simcha Paiva together. Joy breaks through any boundaries, any boundaries. The Rebbe said it over and over and over again. At Fabrenian, at gathering after gathering, Simcha Pirates Geder. There is no place for melancholy. There's no place for depression. The place where Hashem wants us to be is into with Hashem the Simcha. Serve God with joy, with joy, even in the terrible time seeing the destruction of the temple, first temple, second temple. Throughout our history, we've had tremendous tragedies from the Spanish Inquisition to Khmelnytsky to the Crusades, and then, of course, God forbid, the Holocaust and all the other tragedies. You know what? And with all of this, with all of this, what was the Jew able to create? A sense of humor, a sense of laughter, to laugh at himself and to be able to laugh at the world and to look at situations, you know, for what they are and for what they are not. An island. And here we are today, ladies and gentlemen. We're home and we're isolated from each other. And we don't know left from right. One says this, one says that. Do this, do that. If you can't do that, don't do this. Do, we don't know. So in this discombobulation of minds and in this, this at literally an avalanche of information coming at us, we need to say, die no. We need to say, stop for a moment. We need to say, stop and do something that is going to lift up our spirits. What is going to lift up our spirits? Laughter, humor, joy. How do you do that? If you're not a cook, maybe try making something in the kitchen. That should help you. That should be very funny. You know, and have a, you'll have some laughs. But whatever way you go about it, whatever you go about it, it doesn't really matter. As long as you know that you must integrate it into your daily service. You have to. The heart has to sink. It has to sink and it has to be joyous. And if we are able to do this, if we are able to integrate joy into our lives, even in the darkest period that we find ourselves in, guess what's going to happen? We will survive this. We will get through this. Maybe it's going to be at two weeks, maybe it'll be four weeks, but eventually we will survive this because we are survivalists. We are people that know how to survive. The old story goes that scientists said the world is going to be destroyed in two weeks because of floods. All other religions prayed for two weeks. They didn't know what to do. Jews got up and said, brothers and sisters, we have two weeks to learn how to live underwater. That's the Jewish way. We will survive. And if we are able to survive with nobility, and if we were able to survive with joy, that we come out of this, that we're not bitter and we're not angry and we're not depressed, Think about how much greater we're going to feel when all of this is behind us. I can't wait to get together with my congregation. I've been separated for six weeks. I mean, we do Zoom, and I give classes on Tuesday nights and Thursday mornings and Wednesday afternoons, but it's not the same. It's not the same for me. I'm a people's person. I need to be with people. I need to see people. I need to give hugs to the guys. I need to, I need to see to be involved. And I know that after this, how much more I'm going to appreciate this. And I hope that you will also do this, ladies and gentlemen. Now, with all of your studies and all of our prayers and all of our good deeds that we're going to do and reach out to each other and take care of each other, God is going to make this pass, and hopefully it passes quickly. And if it does pass, if it does pass, and you go to sleep tonight, and you remember what Rabbi Perlmutter said, and have laughter in your life, and the last thought that you have before you go to sleep tonight is a happy thought. You know what's going to happen? Tomorrow you're going to wake up happier. And tomorrow you're going to feel better. And you're going to continue that happiness. It's going to be that happiness rotation that you're going to go to sleep every night with a happy thought in your hand until this is over. And when this is over, you're going to actually be a happier person because you listen to what Rabbi Perlmutter said. And when you're going to be a happier person after we get out of this mess, you're going to attract more friends. 
and you're going to attract more friends, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be popular. All of a sudden, you, you, the introvert, who was always never really an outgoing guy, but he listened to Rabbi Perlmutter's message, and he said to himself, I'm now going to integrate laughter into my life. Yes, more popular, more friends. You will be so popular that they're going to ask you to run for public office. Ah, look at you. And you will run, and you'll win. You'll be a city councillor. And people are going to like you because you're, you have a sense of humor, and you know how to laugh. And you know how to you know you know how to make friends and your popularity is going to spread and you're going to become the mayor of your city and then it's going to go even further you're going to go out into the, the national politics and become a congressman you're going to be so popular all because you're happy and you have a sense of humor and people love you people love you and you run for senator and you become the senator of your state look at you starting off as a very shy person an introvert, but listen to Rabbi Perlmutter. Now you're going to Washington as a senator, and one night while you're in Washington and you go to sleep, and on your bed you think to yourself, how did this all start? How did I get here to Washington to become the senator of the great state of California, or of New York, or of Florida, or of Michigan, or of Texas, or wherever which state you're from? How did I become this? And you'll remember that on Sunday afternoon, April, whatever day in April is, I don't even know what day in April it is today, on a Sunday afternoon, you listen to Rabbi Perlmutter. And Rabbi Perlmutter said, make sure to integrate into your daily life humor and laughter. And that's how I got here. And if that happens, ladies and gentlemen, in the unlikely event that this will happen, you will thank me. And you'll remember where it was. And you'll remember that it was worth listening to me for 45 minutes. And if it doesn't happen to you, if you never run for public office, and you never succeed beyond your wildest imagination, at least you'll have a few good laughs. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a sincere pleasure of sharing these few minutes with you. Please, I beg of you, if you don't trust me, look in the Torah under humor and under laughter, you'll see that many great rabbis opened their lectures with humor, many great rabbis laughed, many great rabbis had a good time. You know what? It's not against Judaism. It's part of Judaism. It's the way we deal with difficult situations. So I bless you all to bring a little bit of laughter into your life. And if you can do that, I promise you, I promise you that life will be a little bit easier. Thank you very, very much for paying attention to this. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Please, if you'd like to follow me at Rabbi Yadda Perlmutter on Facebook, I care for you all. I want only the best for you all. I hope that you're all well and safe. Please do everything our government is asking us to do. Stay isolated. Keep social distancing. Wash your hands. Make sure you don't go out unless it's necessary. Please stay safe. Stay healthy. When all of this is over, we'll all get together in one big family with the coming of Mashiach to Kenya. Because God is not going to allow us to go through the suffering without a big payment. And I, that payment, I'm hoping, is going to be the final redemption with Mashiach. And we'll see all of us together in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. And may it happen speedily in our day. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. Thank you.